Well, Pastor Dreyer said I would be talking about a dark cloud. Under a dark cloud, speaking of slavery, part of that shine in 2001-9, there you see it in Roman numerals on that banner there, a blaze church shine in MMXIX, uh, meaning 2019. Well, there was a question that was asked. This was, it was getting dark. As a matter of fact, darkness had already descended and the door to this very humble abode was opening up and a man walked in barely able to get inside and he collapsed at the table hoping there might be some food and some refreshment because he was absolutely exhausted. And she said, his wife said to him, well, how did work go today, honey? He said, I worked like a slave. And she said, well, no wonder, we are slaves. And the, the little child who's sitting in the corner playing with the few toys that he has, uh, listening in on that, and a little question comes up in his mind. And in a little bit, it's time for him to be laid down for bed on his mat there in that simple one-room house. And uh, he asks, Mom, Mom, how did we ever get to be slaves? Well, let's pick up on the story and kind of how that went. What did she tell him? Well, she said, you know, that's a, that's a long story and it's a long time ago. But once upon a time, we were the freest people on the face of this earth. We descended from 12 brothers who were the sons of Jacob. You've heard about Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And there were 12 tribes. And in fact, we can still identify our tribal membership as we look back. But back then, we were in another land. And, uh, and it's, it's a long story about how we got here to Egypt, but we were invited to stay. And at that point, we were at the top of the food chain. We were given the best land, but it was a different kind of a pharaoh than what we have today. Not like the one we got now, Back then, Joseph, who was one of Jacob's sons, was very big, very big in Egypt. Second only to the Pharaoh and son, you know, the Pharaoh, that's the king of Egypt. Well, we became numerous, we prospered. Life in Egypt was very, very good. But in time, that Pharaoh that really liked us and did all kinds of good things for us, well, he was defeated by another dynasty, and his dynasty passed out of existence, but this new king, this new pharaoh, did not like us at all. As a matter of fact, he began a, a program of oppression, which was followed by genocide. First, they took away all of our rights, and then they took away our land, and then they pressed us into, into forced labor with cruel slave masters over us, and we descended to the bottom link on the food chain, they made us build the store cities of Ramses and Pithom. And as a matter of every day, stomp that mud, make those bricks, carry the bricks, mix the mortar, and lay the bricks, work in the fields, backs under the whip all the time, tote that barge, lift that bale, made our lives most miserable. And that is how we got to be slaves. But you know, that story that she told, that's only a part of it. It got worse. That's just the start. Um, the, the, the whole program of genocide, the midwives, the ladies who delivered the babies, their names are, are, are actually passed on to us, Shifra and Pua. They were ordered to kill all the baby boars as soon as they were born. Now, but they didn't do that. Their excuse was, well, you know, you make these Hebrew women work so much, they have become so strong that they deliver the babies before we even get there. So, sorry, we just haven't been able to do it. Well, the Pharaoh made another edict, and that is that every baby boy that is born has to be put to death. And so things have gone from bad to worse. Next week, we're going to find out what happened in that. But the chilling measures commanded to kill every baby boy. And you ask yourself, 
has God's plan that he had in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that God was so clear about and said, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, has that plan stalled somewhere? Is it going to meet its fulfillment? Well, you know, there is the story behind that story. Remember, we'd been talking about the creation, the fall of all mankind into sin, and then the flood for the destruction. But through that flood, the saving of eight people, Noah and his family, and then the spreading of the nations, the confusion of the languages after the Tower of Babel. And then God sends a man or talks to a man. His name is Abraham. He said, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And God makes covenant with him. And in time, God fulfills that covenant promise and gives to him a son, well, meaning laughing boy. Yeah, the name was Isaac. Ha, ha, ha. And Isaac had a son through whom he passed on uh, that promise of the covenant, Jacob, who had 12 sons, and one of them had that special coat. His name was Joseph. But then they end up in Egypt and ultimately in bondage. And that's where we find them today. God's plan, has it stalled? Well, let's think about the life of a slave. It's a dehumanizing life. We know about that from this, uh, this sordid legacy of slavery in the Americas. And there are still places in the world where people are pressed into slavery. And that whole matter of human traffic is a sordid and sleazy part of that whole thing. And it is dehumanizing to the people who are the victims, and it is also dehumanizing to the people who practice slavery and hold slaves. It despises God's creation of man in his image. And if God has created man in his image, has he made some people intrinsically better than others? Absolutely not. And if Jesus Christ died and paid a sacrifice for the sins of all the people of all of the world and it left none out, is then there a hierarchy of importance of people in the eyes of God? God values the pauper as much as he values the prince. And then think about the people who are the most vulnerable in our world. For example, the unborn. Don't try that in the, in the state of New York, the unborn. How about the, the mentally impaired? What about the feebly aged? No human being is meant at all to be harmed, exploited, or abused by anyone. Pastor Dreyer mentioned, you know, that commandment that says you shall not murder, but it's bigger than that. Embittering the life of any one person, there's a commandment about that. And so a dark cloud is now hovering over Egypt, over the heads of these slaves. The heads of these slaves, their freedom has been maliciously taken away. But we're going to talk about something that's even worse than that. There is a worse bondage. For that, we have to go beyond Egypt. We've got to come to actually see all people of all times, including ourselves, that bondage which extends beyond the Hebrew community. I'm talking about sin. That's the real dark cloud. Now, understand this, that sin is not just a now and again act of mischief, or even of disobedience to the law of God. It is an underlying condition. It is the disease. The sins that we do are simply symptoms of the disease. Now, does a person have cancer because that person has a headache? Or does a person have headache because he has the cancer? Am I a sinner because I have sinned? Or do I sin because I am a sinner? You get the point. I sin because from birth, from my conception, passed down through all the centuries and all the ages from Adam and Eve, I'm a sinner. And that's why I sin. Now, when we get into the New Testament, there is an imagery of slavery used to describe what, in fact, sin is, what that human condition is. It is a, a kind of slavery. We're going to have to look at the words of Jesus in the 8th chapter of John, this is what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, 
If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Hmm. Is there a freedom that's needed? Well, then they answered him, hey, we are offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. Yeah, good luck with that one. How is it that you say you will become free? Didn't we just read about, you know, the slavery of these people, their ancestors in the land of Egypt? So Jesus answered, this is what he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices, who makes a practice or habit of sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The, sla the son remains forever. Now, so if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. What? We have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we will be free? And so Jesus has to explain it. And he explains it by saying that if you make a practice of sin, I do, we all do, then we need to be set free. So there is a universal need for freedom. There is a universal need to be set free, to be set free from that bondage. You see, it's a slavery. It's a bondage. That's what sin is. And no person is capable of freeing himself. There is a control that is exercised by sin. Jesus said, everyone who makes a practice of sin is a slave to sin. And he could have said right there, and they cannot set themselves free. The slaves in Egypt, they couldn't set themselves free. God had to intervene. Wait till next time. You're going to find out more about that. Now, there is a certain kind of a problem, and that is uh, the problem of denial. Say, hey, no, no, I don't need to be set free. You know, I can stop any time I want to. But now, admitting that there is a problem is step one in any program of recovery, any road to recovery. If you've ever heard of the 12 steps, first step is admitting to being powerless over the addiction, whether alcohol, drugs, and uh, finding more and more kinds of addictions, you know, whether it's gambling or whatever. Okay, there, we are admitting that we are powerless over sin that we cannot free ourselves. It's going to have to take a rescue that comes from outside of us. So why is it that I keep on doing the wrong things, thinking the terrible thoughts, feeling this or that way, and why do I have envy and lust and resentment and fear and pride, and um, why am I so inward focused? Why am I uh, having so much self-love and then self-hatred at the same time? Uh, lust for honor and lust for approval. It just kind of goes on and on. And um, if, if I haven't mentioned anything that's a part of your life, you could probably come up with an even longer list. It has a way of making a claim upon our inner self and to try to take over our lives. That is slavery. Jesus talks about the, the practice of sin. You know, you can get pretty good at things if you practice them. Now, in my family, I was one of five. I had two older, I had an older brother, an older sister, a younger brother, younger sister. I was the one in the middle. They practiced piano all the time. They practiced real hard. I did not enjoy practicing piano. I was probably ADD, and if I didn't get it in about 10 seconds, I really wasn't that interested in going through what I had to do in order to become proficient at it. But they practiced it, and they got really good at it. And the more we practice sin, the better we get at it, and the less effort it takes on our part. And pretty soon it feels just like the natural thing, because, you see, sin is in our very nature. You see the connection to slavery, which is a much greater problem than is commonly thought, and it's a terrible thing. Uh, and it does terrible things to people. It, it separates, first of all, people from God. Uh, Isaiah the prophet said, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. Uh, the apostle Paul writes and says uh, that sin brings death. The wages of sin is death. 
It is the common inheritance of all human beings. So the question, this dehumanizing that sin, that slavery that sin does, have you taken step one? And that is admitting. Have you made confession? Was your heart in it when Pastor Dreyer led us in confession tonight? That was step one. It's admitting, admitting that fact. Well, now enough about that. We've got to meet the bondage breaker. So we get, this is where Jesus comes into this, and this is where step two. Step two in recovery says, accepting a power greater than ourselves. Now, in secular programs of recovery, they're pretty vague about that, but in Christian and Christian application of it, it specifically brings you face to face with Jesus Christ. You see, I don't need a vague Savior because I'm not a vague sinner. I need a, a Savior that is the real thing, the one who is the bondage breaker, the one who intervened in the lives of these slaves in Egypt. And so what did Jesus do? He experienced our bondage. He, in a sense, he became a servant. He became a slave. He took on that form in order that he might do this, that he might go to a cross. And there suffer all the hurts, all the problems, all the pains, all the punishments, everything that had to do with sin. Jesus suffered it there on that cross. And then he smashed that power of sin and that bondage of sin into a million pieces as he rose up from the dead. Well, he became a slave to free the slaves. John 8, we'll go back there, says, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. That Son is no one less than Jesus. So what's important for us? Breaking free and staying free. I know sometimes it's really kind of hard to stay free. How do we do that? Well, we got to get rid of that old Pharaoh that's, you know, over us, uh, that, that sin power, and to get a new master. We have to surrender to a new king, and that king is Jesus. I'm going to have you look at Romans chapter 6, and uh, a couple of verses there. In Romans 6, so you must also consider yourselves, how? Dead to sin and then alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign, have the rule, be the Pharaoh, be the master in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Now here's the thing. If you are in Christ Jesus, it, and it's a beautiful thing. In Romans 6, it says, uh, we're baptized into his death, that we're incorporated into his death, and that by faith we are participants in the death of Jesus Christ. And so we are dead. We are dead. And um, consider, he says, consider yourselves dead as far as sin is concerned, and, and that sin should have no more appeal to us than it does to a dead person. Okay, so um, indulge me in this little illustration. There is a corpse, and you take a freshly grilled, incredible steak, and you pass it in front of the nostrils of that dead person. Is that dead person going to be attracted to it? Absolutely not. Sin should have that kind of attraction to us, because you see, we have died. When Christ was crucified, well, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. But on the other hand, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me who died for me and gave himself for me. And uh, another place it says, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised. But now, staying free... That can be a little bit challenging sometimes. So the children of Israel, when they got on the other side of the Red Sea, they were sometimes tempted to go back into Egypt. Have you ever been tempted to go back into the old life and to think some of the old thoughts? 
hold some of those same passions, to go into some of those old things that are part of the old nature from which you, through Christ, have been set free. Now, it might have been hard for those slaves who are now free because, you see, their minds had been programmed. They, their way of life was, you listen to the voice of that slave master, but they don't have to any longer. You wake up in the morning and you maybe think, you know, Oh, I'm still in Egypt. I'm still a slave. I got to get up. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, you are free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. That's the whole purpose. In freedom, Christ has set us free. Galatians 5.1. And stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. You are not under obligation to sin. You are not under obligation to anything in your past. You are under obligation to the one who loves you, the one who sets you free, the one who loves you more than you even love yourself, the one who is smarter than you are, the one who is wiser, the one who is stronger. And he is, one, is the one who says, surrender your life to me, and you will have the freedom that you so strongly desire, the freedom that you want living in the forgiveness of our sins, and then saying, Holy Spirit, fill my life. Holy Spirit, take over my life. Holy Spirit, conform me to Jesus Christ. And something beautiful begins to happen, living an empowered life in Jesus Christ.